So hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this session of the McGill Executive Institute's Level Up webinar series. My name is Eric Sain, Director of the Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you. I see we have people from Montreal, bienvenue, people from around Canada, and even around the world. So thanks so much for joining. This session is going to last one hour and include time to answer your questions. We want this to be very interactive, so don't hesitate to uh, post your questions and comments in the chat button, our chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen. And for better video viewing, we ask that you keep your video off. You can do that by clicking on stop video in the lower left-hand corner. The session is going to be recorded and will be shared with you afterwards. So we're very proud to welcome your webinar leader for today, Shoeb Hossein. Shoeb is a professor of operations management at the Des Hotels faculty of McGill University. He is also the program director of the Masters of Management and Analytics. And he also has a private sector background as a consultant in analytics. You'll also be joined today by our director of public programs, Pam Sorrenti, who will be moderating today's session. So again, thank you for joining. And with that, let's get started. Over to you, Shoeb. Great, thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. And uh, really looking forward to the session today. I thought I'd stand to start the presentation and uh, get things kicked off. Uh, really appreciate everyone joining and uh, hopefully we can have a, a, a great session today. So today's topic is about um, uh, analytics entrepreneurship within organizations. And so here's the agenda. I wanted to quickly talk of, of a couple of key topics. The first one is why industries and organizations need better analytics for data-driven decisions. The next one is after I kind of tee it up a little bit and provide some context, I will then talk a bit about a couple of examples of what uh, entrepreneurship projects look like, uh, specifically at the program that I teach at, the Masters of Analytics, where uh, we actually do these projects for uh, client consultants, uh, industry clients. And then lastly, we'll just talk a little bit about creating a data-driven decision environment within your organization. So how do you guys uh, potentially get this started off in your organizations if you either have them and take them to the next level or want to start and create? So I'll try to make it as interactive as possible. I do have a lot of content, so I'll try to get through this as well. But as, as we said, please uh, add your information in the chat and we'll try to uh, get to that as soon as we can. So I'll, I'll spend a very quick on this one. I'm sure you're all here because you all agree that you know, data-driven decisions is the way forward. So to try to get from lead, from, uh, you know, if, if you don't uh, do some of this, you might become a leader and you might be a leader and you might you know, get down to, uh, you know, lagging in the industry if, if you don't uh, keep up on this. So there's a couple of just uh, data points around, they've done some studies around how uh, companies, as you see on the right, there's some uh, companies that, you know, have uh, maybe not have succeeded over time, but, um, you know, need to kind of change and reorganize. And it often comes down to the technologies that they use. At the bottom right, you'll see just a survey that was run with executives talking about the first line mentions, you know, survey participants report that they have yet to forge a data culture. So we're still, although we've done a lot in the industry, we're still at early stages uh, in building this kind of data analytics culture within organizations. So I want to bring up a concept called entrepreneurship. It's a little bit of the sibling to entrepreneurship. And those of you who are like me and, and can't really start off a new venture in our parents' garage, uh, well, entrepreneurship is, is an area that uh, we think could be useful. So what it is, is it's thinking like an entrepreneur, but within large organizations. And I think I can speak to that because McGill is a fairly large organization, but our Masters of Analytics program is only two years uh, old, and we're really trying to uh, you know, push the envelope with a lot of things that we do. Uh, it, it talks a little bit about integrating risk-taking and innovation. So try to use that similar to what an entrepreneur does, but again, within uh, a larger organization. So here's an example of how to try to foster some of that support. Uh, at Google, um, and again, this, this is a, a report written uh, some time ago in 2015, it talked about how Google actually allowed, if you see in the yellow there, uh, dedicated 20% of a Google employee's time for what they call non-core projects. So it's, 
it's open, you can kind of create and collaborate. And that's one day out of five that, uh, that they're allowing this. That's a pretty sizable portion. And they feel like that fosters a lot of that innovation that would happen. And so in a similar way, if we can kind of dedicate some of those to have kind of data-driven projects, that could be a step that an organization or organization's management could take. So that's a little bit of background in terms of uh, entrepreneurship and, uh, and analytics. Um, I'll talk a little bit about data science versus decision science. And I'm gonna use them somewhat interchangeably after this first section, but I just wanted to light it up first. So first off is we, from a decision science perspective, we wanna say, why is it important? So I really think about these two things as a top-down versus bottom-up approach. So decision science is why is it important? What do we need to get up to a workable solution? And who will be impacted? So those are some of the critical things that we look at if I was a decision scientist. As a data scientist, I want to work from the bottom up and say, okay, well, how does this work? How mathematically, technically does this work? And then the bigger question is, why is this not working? Uh, some of the issues that come up during that process. So from a decision scientist, we look at, again, higher level data identification. Uh, we look at statistics through KPIs. We try to have a 360 degree view of the organization and the problem. If I start from the data sciences side, we really talk about data acquisition. We're constantly experimenting. There's a lot of statistical rigor involved um, and they often have like a deep, deep knowledge of their product, but not as much of an overall view of the ecosystem. And we have to meet in the middle. I often say a decision scientist isn't good without knowing the data science and a data scientist isn't as good without knowing the decision sciences. So at the MMA program, we're really trying to you know, foster this, uh, this middle ground and we really try to look at a data as an enabler. So we're looking for data patterns, insights through algorithms and statistics, and of course, looking for uh, correlation, but also causal relationships. So that's kind of really kicking, uh, kicking it off. I'm gonna now just rejoin you on, as I'm seated here and let's go through a little bit of an exercise to kind of get our creative juices flowing. Um, Pam, I'll ask you to just kind of uh, talk to me about some of the um, questions that come up. I'm but here. If, all of, <laughs> if all of us can think about, um, think about the apps that we use, think about those that kind of are automated and think about things that you can't live without. Uh, just kind of post them in the chat and then Pam's going to pick one for me and I'm going to on the fly try to dissect it by looking at each of these apps from a user experience perspective, from a data perspective, modeling and technology. And, and Pam, maybe if you can give me three, I'll, I'll try to pick the one that uh, I think could, could work. Perfect. So let's spend a, a minute or so. And if you can tell me about, you know, a great app that you use that you really think you can't live without uh, that really helps you and automates the process. So we have a couple coming in through the chat here. Uh, Instagram, a couple times, the calendars, RSS feeds, and tools that create them. What WhatsApp, okay. Google Maps, What's yeah, okay. Telegram, Inno Reader, MS Teams. Okay. Yeah, I think. So uh, let's try. Let's try Google Maps. I think we're all, all right. pretty familiar with Google Maps. So I'm just going to uh, jot down a few ideas of how I would dissect this if this came up as a as a use case. So in terms of the business impact or user implications. We also think about, you know, getting, you know, getting to location faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another thing about is often traffic from a, if I think about from a uh, city perspective, the city officials might want to also use Google Maps because it actually reroutes people if there's uh, too much traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, from a data side, uh, what uh, if anybody knows, feel free to also type it in the chat. As I'm going through this, if you have any ideas, and kind of if you see anything new that I haven't written. Yeah. So anybody interested? Yeah, um, from the data. So no. From app. The data perspective. Uh, if you uh, if you, if you know that they like, how do we? How does um, you know Google Maps work? It needs to know where people are. And if you uh, if you have a if you know this tool, it actually uses a lot of phone data. So phone data and you know signals. Mm. Someone wrote phones. real time, almost real time data. So I guess that's yeah. the phone signals. Yeah, almost real time. Um, and then we also have to think about where does this data reside, right? So there's also the, uh, the network carriers. Mm -hmm. 
So something like Rogers, AT&T, that type. And then also some of the data actually resides with the phone manufacturers. So I know Apple and uh, Google often have uh, hold some of this information. So not only do we have to think about what data we're gonna use, we also have to think about who owns it. Because if I have to make a deal with Apple or with Rogers, then you know, we have to make sure that we can actually access that data. Right. So Somebody wrote have... the cloud infrastructure. Okay, yeah. yeah. I think we a lot of these might be uh, being posted to the cloud. Perfect. <laughs> okay. uh, so that's a little bit on the data side. Uh, now I have the data. Uh, from a quantitative side, how do I make it work, right? So there's a lot of what's called root optimization that happens here. So if I think about, well, I, I see a lot of signals coming from a certain particular area. What it does is it takes a signal at one second, sees where the car is the next time, and it takes another signal. So there's a lot of displacement calculations being done there. You can also, uh, uh, in terms of the data we could add here, we have to take into consideration uh, some traffic, um, you know, you might take time of day might matter, right? Because usually during rush hour, we know specific patterns as we see, like the highways are always jammed during that time. So we're really trying to look at what are some of the various factors that would come into creating that route optimization uh, situation that we do. Now that I have the data, I've taken a look at, at some of the math that's involved, and that's the quantitative. The next thing is the technology. So as we know, this maps needs to come in real time back to us. So let's just say, so I got the data in real time and return uh, the results in real time as well, or near real time, let's call it. Andrew said GPS. Okay, yeah. I also need to understand and, and factor in the GPS. There has to be an app built right within mm -hmm. your phone. So that's gonna be Android or Apple to start. Um, and it has to fit seamlessly on devices, right? So obviously with, uh, with Android, those are various other devices. Apple actually owns the operating software for theirs plus the device. So there's a number of things to think about. And if you're a designer, sometimes you only go with one platform versus another. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these are various specialties that people have. So there's a lot of different considerations uh, that we often go through that uh, we, we take a look at. So I thought we'd just go quickly through that and exercise like that. I'm sure the, the people at Google Maps team, as they were to design this when they started, they probably did a breakdown like this uh, as they go forward. So you want to have a strategist, you want to have technical people involved because solving a problem isn't also just about the, the technology. So let's move on to uh, what I call the three A's of data science. So accuracy, automation, and the last one which is called agreement and action. So the accuracy is again, a lot about the quantitative part. And this is where I try to teach my students to like, we're not gonna figure everything out on the first iteration. And so a decision scientist also says, is this accuracy better than my competition? So I have a competitive edge, or is it just better than before? So I can show improvements in my product. Uh, from an automation perspective, we think about, okay, well, help me reduce these mundane tasks. So for us, if you ever remember, we used to pull out maps in a car, uh, you know, or, or figure out or guess where we need to go in terms of Google Maps. We don't need to do that anymore. Um, so some of those uh, repetitive or mundane tasks are gone. Uh, and then the agreement, again, is like, how do I explain this to the user? Well, they actually have a route map on the, the Google Maps. And uh, oftentimes, if you take a wrong turn, they can explain that you need to take a new route now. So these are some of the things, and I'm sure, uh, obviously, with that tool and others, they do a lot of testing and adjustment as they as they work through the process. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about success metrics when you come up with projects. And there's an important concept called outcome bias that I think we should think about. Uh, and again, we could probably do a whole session on outcome bias, but I just wanted to intro the concept. And it says that. Um, depending on your success metrics, if you only look at the outcomes, you may not make proper decisions. And so sports is a good example. And uh, the, the book on the left talks a little bit about, you know, making sure we evaluate the decision on its own, of course, thinking about outcomes, but not solely relying on outcomes. So in sports, we often think about, well, if the team wins, then it was a good decision but that's not necessarily the case. Um, and so there's, there's some really good discussions about that. And I think we need to think about some of those things inherent when we build our success metrics. 
So with the projects that we run, we often think about, okay, as of today, what are what would we consider this project as being successful? And then we could potentially tune that, those outcomes with the, uh, uh, we can tune our approach with the outcomes that, uh, that we see as well. So if you want to read more, we'll provide you with some links on, on books like these that help you kind of understand uh, how that works. So I'll try to also pause uh, through uh, each of the sections. And uh, I don't know if there's any questions that I could take on the first part about decision sciences versus data sciences. Uh, there was a question that came yeah. uh, a little bit earlier. So okay. can data science techniques be used with any data sets or must the data be collected in a specific way in the first place? So that's a great question. I think um, usually the uh, algorithmic approach fits the data or the problem. So if I want to do a predictive model, uh, I'll use a certain set of algorithmic approaches, but then depending on the type of data that I have and the frequency that it comes in, I might need to adjust. But okay. you could also take it from the other view and you can say, well, I want to use a specific algorithmic approach and then therefore I need this specific data set. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of could mix and match in a couple of ways, but um, you know, I think uh, if you have multiple options, that's typically the best. Okay, great. Okay. Um, and how does decision science integrate within design thinking and, or does it? And at what, at what phase of the design thinking, um, the, the four uh, journey there? So that's a good point. Um, I think design thinking is a part of data sciences. I'll talk about the various uh, roles that people play in projects. Mm -hmm. And once we get there, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll highlight where design thinking fits. In. Excellent, perfect. Okay, that's good for now. Okay. Great, so let's move on to, uh, so this is, I'll talk a little bit about working examples. So these are some of the projects that uh, master's students who have either zero years work experience up to you know about five to seven years work experience, they do as core parts of our, uh, uh, of our program. So what we do is we try to match students with uh, industry clients. And here are some of our clients. We work on all industries, data and decision sciences, again, can apply, be applied in any industry, to any company. And here are some of our clients, uh, some big, some small. Um, and then how do we figure out use cases? Well, uh, oftentimes I remember in our first year, um, I would ask the clients, so what would you like us to solve? And then they would say, um, what can you solve? And then we do a bit of song and dance and, and then we get to a point where we figure out uh, what is important and what's solvable. So here are some of the use cases that we've done in the past. Um, and so we've done fraud detection, we've done supply chain predictions, market expansion is often a very popular one because obviously people need to grow their revenue. So expanding their market or their products is, is always a popular one. But again, there's, there could be tens, hundreds of different use cases. Uh, and often what I find is like, if I'm doing a market expansion use case for RBC, I could probably do it for Pratt & Whitney as well. So it really, you know, oftentimes there's a little bit of tailoring, but um, it, does, it does kind of work across the spectrum. So as I figured, how do I explain to my clients what can we do? Well, I think about problems in three dimensions. Uh, the back end, which is really about the data management part. And you can see an image there about a data pipeline. The middle end, which is really about the quantitative mathematics calculation part. As you can see there, there's a lot of code that, that's written. Um, and then the front end, which is about, well, I don't really want to see the code for my end users, so I need to put it in a bit of a either UI, uh, user interface, or a dashboard, uh, or an app. So I say we can do any of these uh, projects. We can do a combination of the three. We say our sweet spot is the middle end because we're an analytics program. We focus more on the quantitative side, but we do teach our students uh, the other sides as well so that uh, they can have a holistic uh, view to the program. So I tell our clients, give us as many problems that you have, and hopefully people on this call, I'm sure your organization is not short of it problems to solve. And I tell our clients, well, we're solutionists in search of a problem. And usually we have a good match because I'm sure you guys have problems and looking for solutions. So, uh, so in terms of how do we prioritize these projects? Well, I look at a couple of different factors, data readiness, technical ease, and business value. And so I'll ask the clients to score out of all the use cases that they present to us, how do you score them on business value side? So that's the last uh, kind of uh, column that you see there. 
And then uh, what we'll do as technical consultants is we'll take a quick look at their data. And then we'll also try to assess very quickly how technically easy is this? And when I say that is feasibility. So if you take a look at my example here, you'll see some numbers across the map. And even though uh, use case number two as a business value was a bit lower, you'll see data readiness is very high. So, and technical ease is actually the highest out of the three, even though it's not as high, absolutely. So we try to look as, as a relative score. This is a very simple way to do this. You could have a, a complex version of this as well, but this is a very simple way to narrow it down and even just reprioritize certain things. Okay, so again, uh, tangible examples. So I'll show you some tangible examples from some of our past projects. So this one is an example on the back end. So technical automation, you had an insurance client, they get a lot of PDF files of company um, uh, financial reports. And they say, well, how do I transpose some of this information into an Excel file, which I can then do some analysis. So on the graph at the top, you'll see that uh, using a Python algorithm, we're able to kind of um, uh, do a lot of similar types of reports in a more structured way and have them as a major group. And then those that are a bit problematic, we need to pull out and uh, redesign them you know, a, a little bit more manual than the other process. So on the bottom left, you see an example of uh, a problem that occurs when we do some of this uh, automation is that you can see that there's a slight tilt uh, on the page for these financials. In some ways it's very similar to the others, but that tilt causes problems for the algorithm to view. So if you see the red box, you can actually see the row above it. There's a slight little bit of text there that's showing and the row that's actually in focus, there's a slight bit of text missing. So that causes some problems that need some tweaking. And uh, as I said, there's probably 70% of the cases we can do in a standard format. And then the other 30, 20 to 30, we need to do a bit more bespoke. So once I do that, I, we built a process where we actually pull out the data. It comes in a CSV file, which then I can use in all sorts of different algorithmic uh, analyses. So that was back end. This one here is middle end, more on the modeling perspective. So this client uh, was uh, selling their products to very large corporate clients. And they said, we wanna expand to the small medium enterprise market. We have no idea what these clients are and we have very little data about them. So please help us analyze this and figure out how we can solve this. So what the students did is they went and they found some external sources. They found uh, usability in LinkedIn, Twitter data, and then scraping some things from their website, from company websites. And from there, once they saw sources, that's the technical side, then on the quantitative side, we had to think about what are the important features, things like company name, uh, contact details. Uh, on point number two, the SEO dashboard, some website traffic, competitors, bounce rates. Uh, and then on the social media side, scrapers, like how do we pull information, things like numbers of employees, job openings because we need to size the market as well as figure out, you know, is this worth taking uh, clients in the SME market? So once they found data, then we need to build some models. So they built a propensity to buy model using some uh, profile data of uh, various companies. They use social media analytics to figure out the companies that they want to target, are they in favor? Uh, do people talk well about their project products? Um, and they built that with some social media uh, information, things like Twitter. The next one is keyword searches. So uh, can we find some keywords? They used Google Trends analysis. That ends up being data that's, that's useful in the market. And stats can they use that as well to see if there's any trends. And then lastly, it is lead generation. So who should we target first? What are some of the companies that are out there? LinkedIn uh, as a company page. Uh, they found uh, useful as well within, uh, within their analysis. So now we have four kind of distinct models. Uh, they sometimes are standalone um, by themselves and then sometimes can be integrated for even more analysis. And then that feeds into a dashboard. So the next one is, is a dashboard. This is a different use case. This was with a hospital that we work with and they were trying to figure out um, how do they predict the PPE burn rate that they're gonna use as they, uh, as they go through their, their time. So the team, uh, again, did a little bit of design thinking. They talked to various users in different groups. 
Um, as you can see, uh, that's the ideation that comes in step one. In step two, they figured out they need to build an Excel calculator. And the reason why they use Excel is because most people at the client site, that's the type of tool that they use. So instead of using something more sophisticated, they use that. And they built a calculator that predicts the amount of PPE used in different groups, and then also aggregated to uh, you know, various divisions. So once they do that, they can also estimate what's out there in the various divisions, who's consuming what, who needs what, and then so that they can actually send their order team flags when they're running low or if they're pacing well or, or not against uh, the users. So that uh, each of those different projects focused on different parts of the data science uh, stages. But as you can see, uh, you know, there's probably a need for all three of these stages at, uh, in almost all situations. Okay, so I'll pause there for another second. Again, I'm, I've got a lot of content to go through, so I just thought I'd uh, explain that to you. Uh, I'll take a pause now. I don't know if there's any comments or questions, and I'm happy to, uh, to take those as well. Um, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be anything, but I'll just give it a second because sometimes people are typing as you ask. So I went through, again, the three uh, various phases of the analytic stages. So this is back end on the technical side, the modeling on the middle end, and then uh, dashboarding and KPIs. Great. Well, I guess everything okay. is clear. All right. Perfect. Sounds good. Okay, so let's move on. And, and again, I can always take uh, questions towards the end. I just thought I'll take a quick pause as we get to each of the different stages. Okay, so now you've figured out that you want to do uh, some data science or decision sciences. You have a couple of use cases that you think you, your organization needs. And now let's figure out how do we actually create this environment within your organization. So we'll talk a little about structure. We'll talk about how we create teams and we'll talk about skills. So let's go into a bit of an exercise as well. Um, and typically I like to say, uh, most of these projects should start at with a business decision. So what are the, what is your area's greatest needs or what could provide the highest lift or value to yours? So are there particular parts of your business that have no data infrastructure? Maybe we could start there because we're starting at ground zero. Are there areas that you have manual processes, you know, that people are doing things manually that you think you can make more efficient? Um, and then are there any others? And so I'll, I'll go through the next uh, example and maybe you guys can also type in the chat. So the first one I'll talk about is low hanging fruit. So it's similar to the greatest need part. Here's a couple of examples uh, that I've seen in, in my experience uh, where there's high data readiness. So the data is available, you own it, it's relatively clean. And we do something like we have to develop some KPIs or build a dashboard around something. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, sometimes a workflow is a good way to start, just designing the workflow and then creating a tool where instead of handing people pieces of paper, uh, there's a computer generated workflow tool that says, oh, you get an email in your inbox if it's your turn to do this. I uh, have done a couple of projects in, um, in banking and they do this with, with credit adjudication where they actually say who's gonna get a loan or not. It has to go through multiple phases. There's a lot of sign-offs. And of course, as you can imagine, before they used to do it on paper and put it in somebody's desk, but there wasn't a good way to track that. So uh, workflow automation also helps you understand where in the process things are too slow or maybe even too fast. Uh, data capture and digitization is, a, is an interesting one as well. Uh, this is the one where, again, a lot of people want to do things, but we might not have the data to do it. Um, and so let's take a second and uh, maybe if you guys can type in the chat, are there a couple of places where you guys think that there's low hanging fruit within your organization? All right, so again, we'll just give it a yeah. quick sec. Um, question, would workflow yeah. equate to digitalization? Uh, it could, the workflow I'm kind of suggesting here is to, uh, just standardize the process and to have the ability to track it. So if I was to think about the data digitization, that was that first use case that I showed you about like actually transforming 
a PDF file into an Excel file. So of course they're probably interrelated, but the, I guess the intention is a little bit different in the workflow automation, workflow automation versus digitization. Right, it's a part of it, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a couple of, uh, yeah, yeah uh, purchasing processes okay. would be, I guess, maybe okay. one, no? Uh, potentially, maybe I could hear more. Uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, what would the need be, maybe. You could suggest okay. if in the process, what would the need be? Uh, if uh, Jay Terrence Brennan would like to elaborate, I'm happy yeah. to say. Otherwise, um, take the next one, yeah. yeah, CRM has data outputs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So customer relationship management, uh, again, oftentimes, like uh, we, we struggle with this at, at my program, we have a lot of uh, companies and, and students also who we're interacting with and just trying to keep a track of them, uh, you know, is often a, a tough one to do. And Understanding what problem. phase of the journey they're in. Absolutely. Stuff. Yeah. All of that CRM customer relationship management yeah. is, is hypercritical. For sure. um, quality assurance, quality control data. Okay. Yeah. Workforce I, I mean, planning. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, that might be part of the workflow automation. Uh, workforce planning. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Definitely internal. Uh, you know, schedule management, all that mm -hmm. type of stuff. Uh, who's working what shift? Um, uh, if you have people in different countries, uh, that that for sure would help. Okay. Multiple signing authorities. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that's something that that kind of that credit adjudication workflow tool was was there to help. Like. Oh. You know, if you need to get sign-offs from different levels, um, you know, sometimes a workflow tool. Uh, you could also up in that tool that we built. You can upload a file so that it's in one place, and people can, with the proper authorities, can download it as well. Oh, makes sense. Um, okay. What about accounts receivable, accounts payable? Sure. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot on the finance accounting side. I think that could work for sure. Okay. Yeah. And last okay, one: yeah, just, automation yeah, of survey data coll uh, collection and visualization. Ooh. Yeah, for sure. So I think the automation of surveys definitely comes in the data capture part. Um, you know, we, we've done a couple of projects with the students and they build surveys. And then I say, okay, guys, when you're, when you leave, who's going to do this and how do we automate this? So right. definitely trying to get that in a web form, uh, something like that could help you build uh, data. For sure. Awesome. Okay. So let's uh, then talk about the high hanging fruit. I don't know if that term is used a lot, but I think about this as the ones that everybody wants to do, but they often don't realize how complex it is. And the reason why I want to distinguish this is because um, although it might have high business value, if you think about my prioritization matrix, if it, if it takes a long time, you know, you might lose people's attention. Um, and I've seen a lot of great projects get put on a shelf because either there's no wherewithal to see the project through or the, you know, the technical ease was underestimated. So things like, uh, I'll give the second example, the dynamic pricing. Everyone also wants to always have, you know, on the fly dynamic pricing. That's a huge thing in retail um, and, uh, you know, manufacturing as well. But optimizing pricing, changing things real time takes a lot of information and, you know, as I talked about the outcome bias as well, like how do we know what is the, the optimal optimal view? Because also things like seasonality might fit into it. And if you don't have a long testing period, something, a pricing strategy that works in the winter around Christmas time might not work in the summer. So there's a number of things to, to take uh, into consideration. Uh, financial arbitrage is something that I think traders often do in the finance market is they're always trying to like find the best price. Uh, that's a, a uh, use case that's been played out so often, but of course there's lots of money involved, so people get drawn to that. Um, and so I'll, I'll take another pause, and if there's anything that you guys think might be really difficult at your organizations, feel free to type it in. Um, I often like to say, start with the low-hanging fruit, build up some acumen, and then you know try to take uh, tackle the the bigger issues as you go. So that makes sense. Gain some experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting um, to hear what you guys think are might be difficult ones. Definitely. In the meantime, while we're waiting for the chat to, yep. to come on board, um, mm -hmm. there was a question about, you know, perhaps for these low hanging fruits, some of the ideas that came up, what is the typical time frame uh, a project mm -hmm. like this might take? To Great complete? question. Yeah. So I like to think about a low hanging fruit, something that could be done with a team of, I'll show you a team of like four to five, uh, you know, sorry, even people working full time. If you can say one quarter, so three months. 
So if you can get a good either proof of concept or even production development built working in three months, that's what I would consider a low hanging fruit. Everything longer, let's say, let's say three to six, three to six, and then everything longer than six months would be a, a, a longer term project that uh, you know needs to be iterated on. Okay, great. Um, there seems to be a bit, maybe um, um, Dominic said sure. thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, there's not really any, you no know, a high hanging fruit examples. So maybe you could no uh, let us know. Uh, no problems. Yeah. So I, as I said, like anything that uh, uh, oftentimes, and so I, I used to work at IBM. Uh, I worked at the two, uh, the team called uh, Watson. That was the supercomputer that, that uh, won Jeopardy. And so the core thing around that was about machine learning and natural language processing. And so everyone wanted it, right? Let's get Watson to solve all of our projects. And they came to us and they said, I want machine learning or I want AI. And we always had to pull them back to reality and say, we don't start with machine learning. We start with the problem, what you want to solve. So again, think back to my prioritization matrix and, and uh, what we need to solve there. It's better to fit the solution to the problem, not the other way around. So that's kind of how I would start. So let's let's talk a bit about one the, uh, question. Oh, so yeah, um, sure. is there a standard time split between the three phases? Um, I think the modeling could take the longest, but it also depends on the data acquisition part. If you have a lot of internal data, the back end could go very quickly. Uh, but if you don't, that could also be the heaviest part. Okay. And then I would say dashboarding typically is the yeah, unless you have to roll it out to the entire organization, that typically is the shorter, shorter Perfect. Phase, yeah. okay. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about implementing this now. So how do you start as an organization? Uh, I think about three different formats of a data science or decision sciences team. One is an in-house, in-division team that I say you will have a couple of data scientists or decision scientists in your team. Um, the second one is hire external consultants. So for example, that's what our clients do with us. They, they hire us as external consultants. And then the last one is uh, number three, which is building an in-house center of excellence, which is a more of a centralized group that then farms out to your various uh, uh, divisions for that. So the advantages of in-house in your team is you have more direct applications and some more longer term continuity. The advantage on the external consultants is you have an outside view, a bit of an unbiased perspective and some market best practices. That's good for kind of startups and disrupted industries. And then the third one is a center of excellence. You typically need a bigger organization for this, but that's where you can build on scale efficiencies. You can hire better overall talent often. And I've seen this in, in pharma that they have like the the, the kind of the heft of, of their uh, industry. Um, so they're able to kind of build more uh, uh, in-house center of excellence teams. Now, I like to say uh, a lot of, uh, the, the goal is to try to build a mix of all three because they have advantages, pros and cons to each of them. So I think, uh, you know, trying to get somewhere in the middle is the overall goal because I think each of these obviously has their advantages, but the advantage of one is the disadvantage of the other. Quick question so for you. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, question uh, is, Andrew is saying, as a start, why not teach everyone software carpentry? What would be the, the challenge with that? Or the uh, sorry, what was the second word? Software car carpentry. Um, I think that, I mean, if you can, that would be great. Um, I just haven't seen it work at organizations where they want to roll it out to everybody. Um, typically, you have champions. Um, and if you have, because you need a few of those wins, you need to see some of these analytics and technology projects win early. Uh, and that way, I, you know, I, I would suggest not to roll it out to the whole organization, because if you can at least concentrate it and have some wins, I think that gets people on board. Uh, whereas if you try to roll it out and then, you know, some of these projects stall. Um, sometimes I see that work, but again, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's something that I think. But from a change management perspective. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Cause you're trying to change the culture too, right? You're trying right. to change the culture of the organization. And mm -hmm. usually what I found is if you don't have like a good use case to show that you, you have tangible benefits, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it doesn't quite uh, work out. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about the decision tree. So as I said, I'm gonna start with the business consideration first. It has to have 
business value. And I make a very simple top of the chain here where it's all of my stakeholders are happy. Again, my CEO, all the way down to our, our, our leaders. And typically what they look at is, okay, increase my revenue, decrease my costs. And I know some of you might be in organizations where it's not about the profit, but uh, typically that's a, 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 a straightforward case. So if I then break it down and I say, okay, let's focus on the revenue side, um, I can think about on the, the, the bottom row here is predict you know, the market demand in the industry, predict customer needs, and then automate more revenue generation activities. So the, the key there is if I can automate some of the manual processes, I can spend more time doing things like sales. So we did an insurance project where they had a lot of manual data entry because even the salespeople had to do a lot of manual data entry. Once they got that off their plate, they were able to make more sales calls and then convert more clients. So that's kind of the business start of it. So uh, the business tree then connects to the technical tree, which is the next stage. So the very, very light gray at the top is, is from above, the slide above. And let's focus on the, the medium gray in, in this medium uh, row here, or the middle row. So there's a couple of areas that you could look at from a technical standpoint is uh, better data governance. That's the housing and collection of data. Uh, I call it data overlay. That's the pulling of external data. And that was the use case that you saw when we use Twitter and LinkedIn and things like that. Um, and then there's also better internal data uh, generation capture. So I'm gonna focus on the right side. So if I wanna capture better internal data, well, let's just say I worked at a call center um, the technical side is just the bottom row is I could actually capture some audio calls, right? And so we worked on a use case with um, a call center where they needed to improve the quality of their audio files. So the audio files, the system that they were using was fine, but oftentimes the algorithms didn't quite catch certain things. So that's something that you can look at as well. Uh, speech to text and text to speech, that's a machine learning uh, tool that's used. Uh, all the big players have out of the box speech to text and text to speech tools, IBM, Google, Microsoft, Azure, they all have those tools and you can use those cloud platforms to utilize that. Of course, you could also build a lot of this stuff on your own, but again, unless you're a major organization, oftentimes you could use other, uh, other tools on the market. So that was the technical tree. Now I'm onto the quantitative tree, which again, the first, uh, the first two of uh, these uh, rows are, um, they are from the previous slide. And I'm gonna focus on the middle one here to give you some sense of algorithms that you would need in this. So let's just say for the technical tree, I chose the external APIs uh, to build some sentiment analysis. So in order to do some sentiment analysis, I might have some rules-based uh, activities. And then the next two are machine learning. So ML general language training and ML industry specific training. So if you remember the tools that I told you from IBM, Google and Microsoft and uh, Amazon, they typically give you out of the box tools but it's more generalized language, right? Because they have to get clients across all sorts of different industries. So typically when you buy those, you get a very generalized language model. Now that might be useful for you if you're uh, in an industry that's, that's fairly common, but if you're in a very specific industry with lots of different terminologies um, that only your industry or your company would know, then you need to take it to this third stage, which is industry specific language training. So that's the NLP that I would work on when uh, I was with the uh, Watson team at IBM. Uh, but we did also use a lot of rules-based terms. Um, so it's very important to know that it's a mix of all of these. You don't just solve everything with machine learning. Sometimes a very simple rules-based approach works just fine. Okay, so uh, I'll talk a bit about skills development. How do you build from that previous comment that came out? How do you actually build this within your organizations? Um, and again, this is what uh, the... Uh, the MEI, the Executive Institute does really well is helping you build uh, skill development. So, uh, and this is something that we're working on with, uh, with the MEI team is how do we actually target the right, the specific users and give them the skills that they need in this overall process. So we've defined uh, three pillars as you probably heard me talk about at nauseum, quantitative technology and business. 
and two levels, uh, levels of depth. Core, which everyone should know, and then advanced, which uh, the uh, individuals should, uh, should take. And then I have the different roles. So an analyst will be at the low level. They'll need to understand the develop the analytic implementation accuracy. They'll need to also institute implementation efficiency. So it's a bit of the automation and a bit of the math. The manager who uh, obviously uh, oversees these projects needs to understand the needs of the users uh, well. They need to do a lot of that needs assessment. Um, data source integrity and then technical rigor of the software and make sure they understand which platform and which tool works best. Then the executives get all of these different, uh, you know, pitches. So, you know, it, uh, somebody comes to the team and they say, oh, well, we want to do this, run this project. And they get all sorts of different pitches as to why it's important and why they need it. And so they need to figure out which of these projects yields me and it yields the company the best ROI and which ones might have longer term uh, business value. So when we think about those three different things, data science, decision sciences is also the same kind of body of work, but we tailor the message and the depth of what is needed uh, to these various different audiences. Okay, so I think in the appendix that the slides that we'll send you, there's a, a kind of a mock uh, curriculum as well. So the anatomy of a data science project, just to summarize again, is it starts with the value proposition up top, we then move on the left to a solution architecture. So we have to procure data, manage data, and determine the technical tools. Once I have that set up, I can do some modeling. So data manipulation, I can do some prediction and forecasting. And then when I, uh, then when I want to roll this out to my organization, I would then do some visualization. So how do we consume the results, i.e. making reports? And then how do I help my team, my organization to make better decisions. So uh, how do we build the best of breed um, in terms of skills? Well, I think about four different skill sets to make uh, a decision scientist or a data scientist. The first one is a strategist, somebody who thinks, how do I solve the problem? The next one is an analytic modeler, usually somebody who's heavier on the quantitative side. So what data do I need? What formulas do I use? The next one is the engineer or architect. Uh, how do I automate this process? And the next one is the visualization UI designer. So the question came up about design thinking. It certainly is in the process. And I would say the, U, the visualization UI designer would typically be in charge of that because they're typically in charge of how does this data get consumed? So the biggest misnomer is that this exists in one person. So when people, I get companies going out and they say, well, fine, you know, I want to hire this one data scientist and they'll solve all the problems for me. It typically doesn't work. I think in my career, I only know like three people who are really good at all four of these areas. Usually you have like strengths and then weaknesses. And I think a complementary team works. So when I put my students on the projects, I actually um, look for these skills and make a complementary team. And that's also uh, somewhat how we do our admissions. We're looking for people with a mix of things so that not only will they learn from their professors, but they'll also learn from each other, which is, which is critical. So if you ever want to uh, engage with us, uh, the, the gray box on the right talks about our consulting engagements. It's an eight month project. Um, it's zero fee to you because the students get course credit for it and they get the experience. And then you guys get the project outputs and you get roughly about uh, 800 to 12, uh, 1200 hours of work from, from the students. And there's a link at the bottom that uh, if you wanna hear more about how we run the projects. Okay, so last couple of slides. So as I said, this is a mix of skills, uh, even though they are somewhat distinguished, they overlap quite a bit. So strategy, UX, UI, modeling, solution architecture, you can see there's an overlap uh, from these two in terms of hardware and, and software tools and why would we need them. Uh, between architect and modelers is trying to determine the best model approach, uh, time run efficiency, data components, how do we scale this? Uh, from modeling to UI is how do I take my computational outputs and make it consumable? So it's usually a handoff from the modeler to the UX UI person. And from UX UI is really how do I make decisions, right? How do I understand the value proposition? How do I make better decisions for my organization? 
And then of course, as I try to tell my teams all the time is, look guys, it's all, it's separate, but then it all has to come together into one overall perspective. So how does the value defined in all of these different areas? How do I think about costs and value from a capital expenditure, operational expenditure approach? Those are a lot of considerations that need to be taken into consideration. So I'd highly encourage you if you are uh, about to launch or have launched this is play the long game. Data science, decision sciences is not leaving us anytime soon. It's only going to grow. And even if some of the projects don't work out all the way, you know, think of the long term and stay the course. So this was a project that we run. It was for a manufacturing truck equipment operator. They had faulty parts. The team, uh, they made an analytic model that was, you know, I think 50 to 60 percent accurate. But they found that there was just far too few um, uh, instances of part failures, which is a, in a good way, but then for the model, it didn't quite help. So they looked at the various factors that you see in the, 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 the second set of bullets, individual parts, part groups, supplier, uh, and, and model family, and they still found that the combination didn't quite work. So their way forward was that, look, you know, we actually had no model prior to this, so even 60% is better than nothing because we were just, you know, doing a thumb in the air approach. Um, and so finding the silver lining is important. Uh, they then used this and said, okay, well, in order to build better data, we might make, uh, you know, more time with our uh, suppliers and capture better data and think about the long term. And so I have to, you know, practice what I preach. And what we're doing at McGill is we're trying to build a library of use cases and uh, things. So on our website, you can see some of our projects. We're building that library and it also helps me teach it better to the next uh, group and the next set of clients as well. So um, I, I can say we can do this a lot better as well. We're just in the data collection phase right now, but how do I actually take some of those outputs and then make sure that we instill it within not only an educational standpoint, but our, uh, you know, our, our consulting approaches. So I'll summarize and then I'll go to some Q&A. Um, so to summarize again, uh, organizations will increasingly need better analytics to make better data-driven decisions. We think about optimization, we think about decision-making, it's very critical. Um, I think entrepreneurship is the way, if you, again, if you want to, you know, uh, go to a garage and, and, and build a new concept, you're welcome to do so, but how did the rest of us create? And for me, this is where I found a really good part of my career is I want to create, but I want to do it within an established place. So entrepreneurship is, is kind of the way. So my first point there is, again, need to induce a culture of entrepreneurship. So I think about it as proof of concept, kind of experimental projects, and then try to work towards building that and, uh, and then implementing that into uh, production. Uh, second is about uh, training and support. So how do we make sure we can get from consultants to centers of excellence, uh, develop skills in the sets in the team, build dynamics, build a content library, things like that are important. And then uh, lastly is uh, creating a data-driven environment uh, within your organization. So things like the blockers, again, people will say, I don't have enough time. Well, you saw that Google example where they said, okay, well, you've got a day out of the week to, uh, to do some of these non projects. So that's it. Um, I'll take, uh, I'll pause there. Uh, we've got a few minutes for questions because I know we do have a hard stop, but I'll stop there. And, and Pat, if you have any questions for me, happy to take them. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, the one question from Andrew, uh, so he's still not convinced um, that okay. uh, <laughs> about, about uh, not training everyone. Um, okay. So maybe we can uh, unpack that a little bit more. Um, and he, you know, his opinion is that the long game is teaching yeah. everyone in the organization basic data science skills, which yeah, uh, that, it's a good argument. That's a great part. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, think, I think you're right. I think, uh, yeah, if you're not doing specific projects, we could come back to this slide here and say, well, maybe I can have a training program for, for everybody across the map and uh, you know, implement it right away. Um, if you're convinced, if you have buy-in from the top, uh, if uh, there's not gonna be major pushback from individuals, yeah, that, that could work as well. Um, especially if you have a smaller organization, I think it has a better chance. Doesn't say that a big group can't do that right away, but I think you would have to have a lot of buy-in uh, and people uh, you know, knowing that this is the way forward. Um, 
Dennis just uh, echoed that buy-in is key. Okay. And and yeah. I think uh, that that's a great point that it would really highly depend on the size of the organization. If you're working, you know, a huge organization like McGill to train the entire staff <laughs> on being, they would be, it would be difficult. <laughs> yeah, I would love the provost to say, okay, everyone's going to learn data science tomorrow. Right. Uh, that might be a difficult, uh, difficult thing to do. But I think, you know, I, I, I'm obviously convinced that everyone should learn it. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, uh, but yeah, I certainly wouldn't discourage it if, if you have the, if you have the buy-in from multiple levels. Okay. Um, so Kate's wondering if there's any yep. resources on needs assessments, uh, you know, training or acumen, any kind of uh, uh, okay. that you might be aware of. Aware yeah, of? that's the hardest part, I think, in a way, because that's what business analysis. I, I remember taking a course many years ago and they talked about business analysis and there was like, a, you know, understand the user, you know, try to unpack their day to day uh, activities so when we do that, um, part of this role, the UX UI person, uh, the visualization, part of their role is to actually do some of that. How do I understand the needs of the users? And we do a bit of a process map. So, okay, I, I get in, I log in, I download some data, I run some models, and I send some reports to my managers. So I think that is kind of where you would start. And I know I say, step four here, but sometimes that's step one and then also step four. So it's the beginning and the end. So, uh, but I think, yeah, needs assessment is, is uh, vital and it's hard to kind of, you know, figure out where to, um, you know, where, where to fit that in. Right. Um, okay. On what basis do you select the consulting projects that you will work on with the MMA? Um, Oftentimes I like to see interesting projects because not only do we want to solve a problem with, uh, with clients, but I also want the students to learn new things. And, um, but oftentimes I look at things like that technical ease. Like I say, is this doable? I, I want to have one of the use cases, at least something that we can deliver. And then another one that might be like a, a long-term, wow, uh, I don't know if we can deliver this, but we can certainly give it a shot and, and do that. So a kind of a mix of something straightforward and then something kind of a stretch. Yeah. Right. And then I, what, what the projects that work well is really the clients. If they're enthused, if they want to help teach, if they like working with students, uh, it's a team. If a project goes well, it's because the clients and the students and the coaches work well. If it doesn't go well, it's usually one or multiple groups that, uh, you know, Right. Done. So, you know, usually in our first couple of meetings, if I see a lot of great enthusiasm, then, then that's chemistry it. and yeah. a little synergy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Marilyn had a comment about upscaling yeah. should be a separate contract after input and approvals. Yeah. Um, Andrew yeah, is asking, sure. what do you want an employer to teach students? Uh, during the projects, I think what I would really, what we really ask is to teach them the subject expertise in your industry, right? These students are young. They don't know manufacturing. They don't know retail as much. They don't know video gaming. Uh, so we know the data science, but we don't know how to apply it in the context of industry or your organization as well. So what we usually typically ask is, We'll often, in some ways, teach you guys the, the quant and the technical stuff, but we really need help on why is this important? Why does this industry exist? You know, what are the nuances if, of government regulation you know, uh, in aerospace, for example? Uh, those are great things, great learning points for students. Great. Okay, great. Um, uh, we will be sending out a recording because I know there was a couple of yeah. questions about that. Uh, okay. And I'll take a last question. What sort of raw skills uh, do the kids have? <laughs> Would I teach <laughs> them Python and R? Yeah. Or? So, so no, uh, we teach them that in the program. We also send you a bit of detail about what they're coming in with. So they have a lot of, uh, some of that, most students have like Python to start with as well. We go deeper into that. We also teach SQL, Python, R. We do uh, oftentimes Power BI. And then we do a lot of use case generation and a lot of modeling. So they'll use a lot of machine learning modeling within the program. So uh, if you're interested again uh, and you contact us, we're happy to send you what the student, what we give you with the student. And then, you know, uh, you, you'll see if that uh, fits your needs. 
we'll be sharing uh, some additional content after the webinar. So some of the resources that Shoeb spoke about uh, and the information for, for that project uh, will also be included. So that's all the time we're at, uh, we're at the noon hour. So I just want to thank everyone for joining our Level Up series. And thank you, Shoeb, so much for uh, an interesting presentation on analytics and entrepreneurship. Uh, very, very useful. Uh, so that's actually, this is the last uh, Level Up session of this series. And so we will see you all in the fall. Hope that you will join again. Thank, thank you. you all for joining. I wish we could see you all, but hopefully in the next one, we'll, we'll be able to get to more in-person stuff in the future. Yeah, but thank you all for exactly. joining. Bye, everyone. Thank you.